Dan Schulman, CEO of PayPal, thanks for stopping by today. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brian. Uh, you guys, I was looking over your, your performance for the past year. It's been uh, one heck of a ride. I mean, your stock has outperformed Apple, Facebook, J.P. Morgan over the year to date. What is the market seeing in you guys? Well, I think uh, digital payments yeah. is in its infancy mm -hmm. right now. And I think what the market is looking for are pure plays uh, in kind of what is unfolding in the future. And so uh, PayPal, that is our business, uh, digital payments. Um, we have uh, a lot of scale. Uh, we're innovating now. Uh, we're transforming the company. And that's showing up in all of our metrics. And I think um, as we think about what it takes to continue to grow, it's just that focus on customers and trying to be innovative and, uh, um, and a very large market that we're playing in. Take us through Venmo. Uh, it may have been on a recent earnings call that uh, it was called the crown jewel uh, of PayPal, but it feels as though there's so much opportunity, untapped opportunity. What is the status of Venmo right now? Yeah, um, uh, you know, Venmo is one of, uh, one of our shining assets. Um, we have a lot of great assets inside the company. We do have some 210 million people using our platform, 17 million merchants on it. Uh, but Venmo is beloved by the millennial uh, generation. Uh, it's become, a, you know, a verb. Um, so people uh, ask uh, for somebody to Venmo them money. Mm -hmm. But the secret to Venmo is it's not just a P2P service. It's really the first social um, network payment system. So 90% plus of all payments um, maybe I'll send you something, then I'll tag it with either an emoji or a comment on it that gets posted to your feeds, your friends see it, they see what you're doing, they can join you. And so we're taking Venmo and not just having it be a payment service, but really be a part of your daily life. And then we're adding more and more functionality to it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start to monetize Venmo That's what I to ask by you. yeah by opening uh, up the entire PayPal merchant base mm -hmm. in the United States to Venmo users. So what we're trying to do is just add more and more value. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, shop at a PayPal uh, merchant. When you shop there, that uh, shopping um, journey gets posted on your feed. You can split uh, what you bought with people. People can see if you uh, if you liked it. So merchants are really excited about getting into your social feed mm -hmm. because there's nothing better than a friend recommending something that they just bought. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a real win for merchants, a real win for uh, consumers, and a win for our shareholders. And, and a friend paying for your dinner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, are we looking, are you talking about uh, ads eventually in, in, in Men Memo? Is that one way to monetize it even more? So um, there is no shortage of people that would like to um, uh, advertise in the feeds um, that we have. But I think um, for us, we really want to be very careful. We have a, a, a magic that's happening with Venmo right now. And um, any service that we add to Venmo, we're very careful about it. We want to keep um, um, that uh, value proposition that we have for that market. And it's a particular market that we're serving um, very pure, um, uh, but we think we can add more and more services, monetize it, add more value. Um, whether advertising is a part of that is questionable right now for me. Sure. You guys have just, uh, you've really led first mover and man advantage uh, with Venmo. How big a threat is, you know, we've seen in recent weeks an Apple Pay cash. I mean, this hits at mm -hmm. some point. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you thinking about that? Well, there are a lot of different uh, P2P services out there, and there have been for a long time, with a lot of leading players. Um, what differentiates uh, Venmo is, one, it's not just a P2P service. It actually is tied in to your entire social network. And so um, it is very viral, and the larger Venmo gets, um, the more attractive it is for other people mm -hmm. to be a part of Venmo because there's a network effect. Um, your friends are in it. If you're not in it, it's harder to send you money. And so um, I think that there is a tremendous runway for Venmo. We've seen a lot of services come into the market and Venmo continues to 
exhibit a very strong growth. In fact, I think we've had something like 15 straight quarters where the volume growth on Venmo year over year has exceeded 100%. Um, and so um, I think the value that we're going to add to Venmo is going to be um, uh, more and more attractive to that millennial market. And so we'll always compete against different competitors out there, but I think the value that we have is differentiated and increasingly differentiated as we look forward. The way I'm taking that is almost, uh, it's going to be hard for an Apple or any other competitors to get into this market. I mean, is that is that fair to say? Or make it strong inroads? Um, you know, I, I never like to prognosticate about the future because I think a lot of people have been wrong when they've done that. Yeah. Um, I think our focus needs to be on the value proposition that we provide to certain segments of the market. And if we can do that the way that we have been doing that with a real focus on what are the pain points, what delights uh, customers in that particular segment, as opposed to focusing on competitors and what they're trying to do, I think we'll continue to be successful in that marketplace. What is your view uh, of retail right now? I think PayPal, I think retail. I, on one hand, you have online growing so successfully, you have bricks and mortar doing anything but that. How do you think about retail? Yeah. I think retail is at a very interesting uh, tipping point in its history right now. I think that mobile is going to fundamentally redefine the value proposition uh, that retailers offer to their consumers. It's going to redefine how people discover, uh, how people purchase, um, how people find out uh, about um, um, reorders and, uh, and post-purchase sort of loyalty. And I think that mobile is blurring the distinction between online and offline. Mm -hmm. Previously, to your point, people would think about, well, offline is only growing X amount, uh, online is growing very fast, but, uh, but it's a smaller part of retail. I think mobile has basically broken apart that definition, and commerce is just commerce right now. It is clearly a cross context where people will seamlessly shop between online and offline uh, uh, locations. And that's a great trend that's actually moving in our direction. All of that will be facilitated by digital payments. And uh, when it comes to mobile payments, we clearly are the market leader in that. Our checkout conversion, because of one touch, and we can talk about that later, is almost two times that of the rest of the industry. Um, and so um, that, blurring between online and offline and that acceleration of digital payments into mobile payments um, is a tailwind for us for sure. Speak of blurring, I mean, people are buying things from Facebook, uh, Instagram. How is that changing? I know you've struck deals with some of the social media companies. Yeah. Over the last three years, we've kind of fundamentally changed who we are as a company. We're much more of a uh, platform company as opposed to a checkout product company. We offer a suite of services, both branded and unbranded, and we offer full choice to consumers right now. As a result of that, our ability now to partner across the industry, whether it be with leading tech players like Facebook, mm -hmm. like Google, like Microsoft, like Baidu, mm -hmm. um, Alibaba, um, leading financial institutions, JP Morgan, Wells, Citi, um, Visa, MasterCard, um, we've done something like 20 deals over the last 18 months with major players. Because we are uh, an open, neutral, third-party platform that clearly has the scale and the um, uh, value add that can add a tremendous amount to these partnerships. And so as people tend to move more towards contextual commerce, where com commerce moves to where people are, mm -hmm. instead of having people move to where the commerce That's is, right. like Facebook That's would the be a future. great That's example. That's the future, buying Exa things off of Facebook. Exactly right, yeah. exactly right. We are powering those uh, processes um, and a very uh, strategic partner with Facebook mm -hmm. in allowing that type of commerce and that connectivity between merchants and consumers to happen in the context of where they are. Mm -hmm. 
the Baidu deal you guys recently struck, that's, it was briefly touched upon in the last earnings call, but that might be a bigger deal than a lot of people expect. Yes. Correct? So um, Baidu is um, basically the search engine um, in China. Um, they have well over 100 million people using their wallet right now. It's not an exclusive deal with Baidu. We could do deals with other players uh, in China as well. In fact, we have a pretty big deal with Ali um, as well. Um, but what we're doing with Baidu is we're enabling those consumers within China to seamlessly buy from our 17 million merchants outside of China and really facilitate cross-border commerce um, and allow the Chinese consumers to tap into merchants around the world. That's great for our merchants on our platform. It opens up a whole pool of people. Uh, hundreds of millions of people that previously didn't have access uh, to the merchants on our platform and now do. Um, and with Ali, we've done almost the opposite. We've taken merchants on AliExpress and have opened up our approximately 200 million consumers who use our platform to be able to purchase uh, merchants inside of China. And that's great economics for us. Cross-border is kind of a part of the DNA of uh, PayPal because we guarantee all of those transactions. And if you're a consumer purchasing from a Chinese merchant, you may not know that merchant. You may be a little bit insecure about that purchase, but we guarantee it. Same with a Chinese consumer purchasing from a uh, merchant outside of uh, China. And so that really plays into our strengths and it's something I think we can help facilitate. Sure. Switching gears a little bit, uh, you guys have a lot of cash on your balance sheet, maybe more than seven billion in cash and equivalents. You've said- And no debt. And well. no debt that you're looking for acquisitions, both big and small. What does an acquisition look like for you guys? Yeah. Where are you interested? Yeah, so I think um, a couple of things on that. Uh, one, I think we're in very early innings of, uh, of digital commerce and digital payments and the explosion of, uh, of mobile um, driving that. As a result, uh, there are a tremendous number of things that we want to do. We've clearly moved uh, beyond being one product and into, as I mentioned, that suite of services on a platform. And for consumers, we want to help democratize financial services. We want to take underserved segments of the market and provide them basic consumer financial transactions that go beyond checkout. Mm -hmm. And on merchants, we want to really um, give them capabilities and a full platform to take advantage of mobile so they can get closer to their customers. Um, and that's a whole suite of services. So when I think about the expansiveness of the vision that we have. Um, we have two things we can do. We can innovate inside the company. Mm -hmm. And we've spent a ton of time and effort to upgrade our platform. Sure. And so we now uh, do um, like 30,000 software releases a quarter. We are constantly innovating inside the company. That is a radical difference from where we were before and where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Those investments into our platform or service-oriented architecture um, have really unleashed a tremendous amount of internal innovation and, um, and energy. Um, that means that we have to do less acquisitions than we had to do before. Mm -hmm. But we're always scanning around uh, the world and around the market to see if there is an acquisition, either big or small, that can accelerate our efforts uh, beyond our internal innovation. And do you want to leverage up the balance sheet to do something big? Is that, when you say big, is that something that you would want to do? It depends really on what we're looking at. We have no plans uh, to go and do that uh, right now, but there are assets available around the world um, that range from under a hundred million to a couple of billion. Um, and, uh, and we look at all of them. We look at hundreds mm -hmm. of assets. I always say though, in many times, the best deal you do is the deal you didn't do. Uh, because we're pretty disciplined in how we look at that and we're doing a lot more innovation uh, internally. But that, as you've seen, whether it be with TO or Swift, two recent acquisitions we did, 
will be an acquisitive company going forward because we think there's a ton of opportunity for us to help consolidate uh, the industry and leverage our platform and our scale to provide more services. Sure. You are, I mean, you're a, a tech veteran. Now, I'm not calling you a holder or anything like that, but you've seen pretty much everything. You've brought companies yeah. public, you've been around the block. How would you set up a board right now? I've got to start a company from scratch. We've had the issues with, with Uber, uh, Equifax in the news recently. Well, how should a, a tech company or startup approach setting a, a good corporate board? Well, I think the first thing every uh, company needs to do is establish sort of their mission and their vision. And that's not fluffy, that, that's actually incredibly important. You need to know where you're going as a company. Then your strategy starts to fill in that pathway there and then you have a tactical plan that basically is cutting you know, that, that trail that you've marked out. Uh, but you need to know where you're going. And the reason I say that within context of a board is that if you have an expansive mission and for us, it's to democratize financial services so that managing and moving money is a right for all citizens, not just a privilege for the affluent. Mm -hmm. That means we are serving um, a very diverse population um, uh, within the market. And as a result, our board needs to reflect that reality. Mm -hmm. We can't say that we're, uh, we stand for something if we don't act upon the, that mission and the values that are uh, driven from that mission um, and that vision. Our values are uh, about inclusion. We stand up for them quite a bit. You've seen me in the public arena stand up for that because I don't think that values can be something that you have on your wall um, that people look at and think are very pretty, but you have to act on them. Then they really are your values. Then they are part of the culture. And when you have values that you're living, you have employees that are very attracted to that company because you're trying to make a difference in the world and will walk through walls um, to get things done. The board needs to have a reflection uh, of that. I think uh, boards are the primary governance uh, structure of a company. Um, uh, you know, I'm the chairman of the board of Symantec, mm -hmm. uh, so I have a lot of outside board experience as well. I've seen it both from a board perspective and from a management uh, perspective, and both have a very, very important role uh, to play um, in good governance uh, of corporations. Could this culture that we keep reading about in Silicon Valley, can this be fixed? What needs to get done to get at the root of this? Use that, or this issue we keep seeing. I absolutely uh, believe that uh, companies have a obligation, maybe even a moral obligation, to be a force for good. That means you have to act on it, um, though you can't talk about it and not act upon it. Um, I don't think in our society we can leave um, all of the problems that are out there to government or nonprofits. Uh, or to people who study it in academia. I think it needs to be a combination of all of us coming together. Um, and for instance, there are some issues that really PayPal can't, can't solve. Mm -hmm. um, it's not our expertise. But things like financial inclusion, which are incredibly important, the financial health mm -hmm. of underserved populations um, can be, if we can drive financial health there and help um, improve um, economies just a little bit, that can make a gigantic difference uh, in the world. And so I think um, technology can play a great role in being an inclusive force. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do that um, going forward. It cannot drive further divides. We have enough of that uh, in our world and in our country. And technology can be a force that helps um, but you need to have very clear leadership uh, in companies. You need to have companies that, whose brands stand for something um, that uh, is inspiring. Because employees want that. And by the way, I always feel, if you have employees that believe, you get the best employees, and the best employees serve customers incredibly well. And if customers are served incredibly well, shareholders are served well. And um, that's the power of, uh, 
of um, doing well in the market by doing right for consumers. Before I let you go, take us through your workout, workout regimen. I've heard stories about it, but I'll leave it all. The floor's all yours. Oh, um, well, thanks for that. I know you do a workout, too. Have to. I'll I lose my mind if I didn't. Exactly. I think um, most uh, people try to live a relatively balanced life. I think that's very important. Um, and for me, um, martial arts has been a part of my life for a long time. Um, but what I love about martial arts... Uh, it's not just the physical part of it. There's a, a philosophy that comes out of that that enables you to think about the situations that you face in a very clear uh, way. Um, a lot of people tend to uh, react, either fight or, uh, or flight. But in many ways, you just want to take a step back. You want to understand the situation. You want to approach it in a cool, calm, and collected way. And I feel like uh, working out allows me to think about um, the way I want our company to work going forward, the way we think about competition, the way we serve uh, customers. And that mind uh, and body balance, I think, is very important in leadership in general. Have you implemented this in your office? Do your top executives follow you in this? How do they... You know, for me... Somebody, wellness is one of our core values as a company, but I think everybody has to find their own way uh, in that if uh, dance might be something, spin might be it, martial arts could be it. Uh, there are any one of a number of ways that people achieve balance uh, in their lives, and I, I don't like to dictate that. I think that's a personal choice. Well, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it, and uh, you definitely probably kick my butt. Just saying. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> I it. Want thank, to. thank you so much. All right. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it.